Hi, this is Pastor Ken from Park Place Community Church, and we want to thank you for watching this teaching video. We hope that it's a blessing and a help to you. God bless you. So let's talk this morning about that greatest gift. Have you ever received a gift that you were so blown away, so enamored with, it so took your focus of that gift, you're so drawn away by that gift that you didn't even say thank you. You, you were so in, 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 infused with the gift that you didn't even remember to say thank you. And our Father, God, loves to give us gifts. But sometimes we can get so enamored with the gifts, we can get so focused on the gifts that we forget about the giver of the gift. We, we forget about the, the, the giver of the gifts who actually is the greatest gift of all. And we've all heard the saying, the reason for the season and, and of course, we know that Jesus is the reason for the season. And of course, we'll be talking about that greatest gift in this series. But I wanted to talk about some of the greatest gifts that come along with that greatest gift. And last week, we talked about peace, the, the gift of peace. And the angel said in this announcement to the shepherds, Luke chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And actually that peace is a part of who Jesus is. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's who Jesus is. So what does that mean to us? He commanded this in John three seventeen. God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. See, God wants to come into your life not to condemn you, but to save you. And I don't know what you're going through that is stealing your peace, that's keeping you up at night with anxiety, that, that you know, you're so focused on and you just can't get it out of your mind, and it's stealing your peace. I don't know what that is, but I know that Jesus came to save you from it. And that doesn't mean that all your problems will go away instantly, but it does mean that you will have this sense that everything is going to be okay. And here's the result of that peace if you include Jesus in your life. And that's a big if, right? Because it's always our choice. God never forces himself on us. It's always our choice of if we are going to include Jesus in our life. But if you don't include Jesus in your life, well, then don't complain that Jesus isn't helping your life, right? That's worse than not voting and complaining about the government. You, you didn't have anything to do with it. You didn't help in any way. So how can you complain about it? How can you complain about Jesus never does anything for me when we're not including Jesus in our life? But if you do include Jesus in your life, here's the result. Philippians 4, 7. And because you belong to Christ Jesus, God's Peace will stand guard over all your thoughts and feelings. His peace can do this far better 
than our human minds. How many of you have found that? But Christ does a way better job at guarding our hearts and our minds than, than our minds do itself. And this is such a powerful promise, especially at this time of year. Does anybody's emotions get a little wacky <laughs> during the holidays? <laughs> Does anybody's thoughts get a little off track? Your emotions are giving you feedback that maybe aren't totally accurate. God's peace will guard our hearts, will guard our minds, guard our emotions. His peace will do that. So last week we looked at a part of the Christmas story, this great story that was told by this great theologian and orator, Linus. How many of you remember Linus when, when Linus read the Christmas story? You know, Charlie Brown was all, you know, worked up over nobody knows the real meaning of Christmas. And Linus goes out and he reads the Christmas story. And I know it was meaningful to Linus. Do you know how I know? You know Linus never let go of his blanket, right? Well, when he read the Christmas story, at the end, he dropped his blanket. That's how powerful the story was. It was this great story. But can we be honest for a moment? <laughs> that story, it kind of sounds like a fairy tale. Like, like maybe a, a made-up children's book, you know, that, that it's kind of hard to believe it at first glance how it happened. When we read the story of how it happened, it's kind of hard to wrap our minds around it. Before we talk more about the how, the how it happened, Let's go upstream a little bit from that event and downstream about 33 years later and look at the why it happened, why this whole event happened. Because if we can grasp the why, it won't seem that far-fetched to grasp the how. And, and here's what we talk a lot about in, in this church here. God created you and me. He created all of us to live in intimacy with him, trusting him to lead our lives, to lead us to that life that he desires for us. And we see it here, I call this the great dividing line of the Bible, where you divide, decide who you're going to serve. John 10.10 10 says this, The thief enters only to steal, kill, and destroy. Has anybody experienced the thief <laughs> that has stolen from your life, that has destroyed certain parts of your life? But Jesus said, I came so that they could have life, indeed, so that they could have life and live it to the fullest. See, God wants us to have this full life that he designed for us. So he sent Jesus to connect us back to that life that he designed for us. We see it here in John chapter 1, starting in verse 4. It says, Everything that was created received its life from him, and his life gave light to everyone. The light keeps shining in the dark, and darkness has never put it out. No matter how dark your life gets, the light will always overcome the darkness if you invite the light in. But since the beginning of time, this didn't start with us. We weren't the first ones to do this. Since the beginning of time, we're, we're just continuing it. People say back to God... I don't want to follow you. 
I, I don't want to live for you. I don't want to do uh, what you want. I, I want to live my own life apart from you. Now, I've been there. I've done that. Anybody else have joined me in that? Doing life apart from God? I'm going to take a stab at this life all on my own. I'm going to John Wayne it. I think we all have done that at some point in in our lives. I'm going to do this thing on my own. And we have tried over and over and over again. And over and over again we have have failed, becoming people we never thought we would become, doing things that we never thought we would do, living our lives alone, cut off from intimacy from God and intimacy with each other. And the most important parts of our lives when we do that, like our spirit, like our soul, feel dead or like they are dying because the end result of that decision, that decision of I don't want to live for you, the result of that is always the same and that is death. We see it here in Romans 6.23. It says, for the wages of sin is death. What you earn in life by by saying, I want to live my life apart from you. I want to do my own thing. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. The wages, what you earn from that kind of living is death. But, one of the biggest buts of the Bible, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, why would God do this? When we are denying him, when we are saying we don't want to have anything to do with you, why would God give us this gift of eternal life? And that word eternal, we just think of it as heaven, like we're going to make it to heaven. But that word eternal is actually the word zoe, which means that God kind of life that he designed for us. Why would he want to connect us back to that when we are saying we don't want to have anything to do with you? Well, it's because he had a bad case of the so loves. John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world, See, God could have just loved the world and felt bad that we were off doing our own thing and struggling, but he so loved the world. I used to tell my daughter, Victory Grace, I used to say, Victory Grace, I got a bad case of the so loves for you. <laughs> I, I just so love you, cutie girl. Uh, that was my nickname for her. And, and I, I so loved her. And, and that's what God is saying here. He doesn't just love us and feel bad. He so loves us that he has to get involved. He has to get involved in our situation. So it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Again, that Zoe life, it's not just heaven. It's included in that. Thank God for that. But it's the life that God designed for us to live here. And he never stopped loving us. No matter what we did, no no matter where we've been, what we've done, God never stopped loving us. So he decided to come rescue us and he did it by coming as Jesus by coming as this baby to rescue us he came to us that's what Christmas is about he came to us and he lived this sinless perfect life he taught us who God is and how we can relate with God And then he gave up his life on this cross. He died 
to pay our penalty, the death that we deserved. He died to pay that penalty. And then he rose again after three days as a substitute for us. He took the death that we deserved, beating the power of sin and death so that we can have this new life, the life that he designed for us, we can have that in him. Do you believe that this morning? That's the hope of the world. And if we can get on board with that, the why, why did he do it, then a virgin getting pregnant, long donkey ride, giving birth in a stable, angels announcing it to the shepherds, wise men coming from China, bringing gifts, being led by a star, all the way there. If we can get on board with the why, I think then the how it went down is much easier to swallow. See, the how isn't the toughest part, it's the why. Why did God do it? And if we understand that, that he loves you that much, he still loves you that much, no matter who you are, where you are, what you've done, the why of Christmas is that God sent Jesus to rescue us. So now that we've tackled the why, that we have an understanding of the why, let's look at some of the complexities of the how. We see it in Luke chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 26. It says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy... God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged, we'll talk more about that, to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. So this new character, Elizabeth, is introduced into the story. Who is Elizabeth? Well, Elizabeth is Mary's older relative. We know she was a relative. We don't know exactly what. We've kind of, you know, settled on cousin. We say she was her cousin. We don't know that for sure, but they were related. And Elizabeth was pregnant with who would become John the Baptist, who would baptize Jesus 30 years later. And it says that she was engaged. And we have kind of used this word engage in translations because it's easier for us to understand. But the word actually is she was betrothed. And betrothed is a much stronger word. Like if you had engaged here and married here, betrothed would be somewhere in the middle. Betrothed is actually a legally binding agreement like marriage back in those days. So she was not just engaged, she was betrothed. So Mary is a virgin, probably about 15 years old. And Joseph, she's betrothed to him. Joseph is a carpenter, probably in his early 20s. So everybody good so far? Some people are like, whoa, Mary was that young? Well, that's kind of how they did things back then. But, but if everybody's with me, let's go on. Verse 28, it says, Gabriel, the angel, appeared to her and said, Greetings, favorite woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think of what the angel could mean. Now, this is one of the places in the Bible, I don't know about you, but I'm reading it. And I'm thinking maybe the person who wrote the story about the true things that really happened, maybe this was somewhat understated here, that Mary was confused and disturbed. Because 
an angel, when I read about angels in the Bible, we have this, you know, thinking in our mind of these cute little figures. Well, when I read in the Bible about angels, they are large, imposing figures, and light just emanates out of them. And oftentimes they're carrying one or possibly two swords. So think about this. Mary's like asleep in a room, and an angel shows up. Mary, wake up. Mary. And Mary's like, uh. Ah! <laughs> There's an angel standing in her room, possibly holding a sword, light just emanating this huge, imposing figure. I think Mary was probably freaked out. I bet you she was reaching for the pepper spray. I bet she was ready to call 911. There's this lighted man standing in my room. You know, I think she was probably freaked out, and the angel recognized this in Mary and said, don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High, the Lord God will give him the throne of, the, of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Now, how many of you know that's pretty big time, right? I mean, that's quite an announcement that this angel brought to Mary, possibly kind of intimidating. So the angel is describing what this child will be like, and he starts out saying he will be very great. And I'm sure Mary could get on board with that, because how many moms do we have in the house today? You all probably think your kids are great, right? You, I mean, she can get on board with that. He'll be very great, and he'll be called the son of the most high. Well, she could probably kind of get on board with that. But given the throne of King David, <laughs> reigning over Israel forever, I think that was probably pretty intimidating. So she's what we could call somewhat down with the whole thing. But she has one question. Verse 34, Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. Now, I think that's a very legit question, right? I think it's very legitimate for Mary to ask that. She's 15 years old. She's probably been through health class. She probably understands what it takes to get pregnant. She's betrothed, so I'm assuming that her mom has had, you know, the conversation with her about that special hug <laughs> that's coming <laughs> later, that special hug that produces a child, and Mary's like, I'm going to have that special hug. So she's asking the angel a very legitimate question, how is this going to happen? Verse 35 the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Mary's probably like, oh, that clears everything up. <laughs> oh, yeah, I totally understand it now. No, she was probably like, what in the world are you talking about? So the angel goes on and says, so the baby born will be holy and he will be called the son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say, how many of you have things that people used to say about you? People used to say she was barren but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. 
Now here we go. This is the most important verse of the whole passage. Verse 37. For the word of God will never fail. The word of God, what God says will never fail. Fail. As a matter of fact, let's all say that together. I'm going to count to three and let's read it together. One, two, three. For the word of God will never fail. It'll never fail. So what that saying is, if God said it, it will happen. And apparently that reminder did the trick for Mary Because it says in verse 38, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. Then the angel left her. Can I give you the PKV, the Pastor Ken version? Mary said, I'm in. I'm in. I'm on board. I'm fully on board with what this plan is. Let's do it. Now, as hard as that conversation was, How many of you realize that was a hard conversation? I'd say the next conversation that's coming is as hard, if not up one level, because remember, Mary is betrothed. (laughs) Betrothed is above engaged. It's just short of marriage, but it's above engaged. So how many of you know she's headed for the worst date night in the history of mankind. Because imagine, she needs to talk to Joseph. Just imagine for a moment of Mary's conversation with Joseph. So, Joseph, my love, my dear, my one and only... You know that I love you. You you know that I can't wait to marry you. I'm so excited, so excited, so excited. Have I told you that I'm excited to marry you? But we do need to talk. There's a little something that you might want to know about, I'm pregnant. But relax, relax, because it's from the Holy Spirit. (laughs) I'm going to give birth to the Son of God. Surprise! (laughs) Well, it didn't go that well. (laughs) The conversation didn't go that well. And if you bounce over to Matthew chapter 1, we see that Joseph wants to break up. He he wants to break up. He wants to break it off. But he wants to do it quietly. He, He wants to do it. He doesn't want to make a big deal about it because according to the law at that time, she could be stoned to death for having sex outside of marriage, especially being betrothed and getting pregnant, and it's not from the guy that you were betrothed with. So he wants to break it off quietly. And you know what? I can't say that I blame him. (laughs) That's a pretty far-fetched story, right? I'm pregnant, but it's from the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give birth to the Son of God. It's a very far-fetched story. And Joseph isn't buying it. But let's pick up the story here in Matthew chapter 1, starting verse 20. It says, as he considered this, considered what? Getting rid of Mary. As he considered ending the whole thing, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will what? Save his people 
from their sins. Now remember that. We'll talk more about that later. Verse 22, and all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophet. The prophet was Isaiah. He told about this story hundreds of years before it happened. He said, look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. So now Joseph is on board, right? The angel has rectified the situation, convinced him. Joseph is on board. He says, yes, God, use me. But his problems are not over here at this point. They're actually just getting started because the Roman government had called a census. They wanted to count all the people so they could properly tax them. So they call the census, and everybody has to go back to their hometown. So he must take his pregnant wife, come on, nine months pregnant, back to Bethlehem. A 90-mile trip would take about four days on a donkey. Now, this is not something that I could ever understand, but how many gals do we have in here that have been pregnant? <laughs> Can you imagine being nine months pregnant on a donkey on this, you know, trip that is chaotic, over hills, mountains, everything? I think maybe that's where the term silent night came from. Because I don't think Mary was wanting to talk to Joseph <laughs> at, no, at those nights. It was a very difficult thing. And then they arrive in Bethlehem, and we have what we have termed no room at the inn, right? We're thinking Motel 6. They show up at Motel 6, and the no vacancy sign is on. That's how we think of it. But contextually and historically at the time, it was probably a relative's home. The, the word that's translated in is a home that has like a spare room. And, and so he, remember, he's going back to his hometown where all his relatives, his homeboys, everything, you know, are in this town. And he knocks on the door of his relative. They answer the door and they say, you're not coming in with her that blankety blank blank bleep. See, we sanitize the story. We sanitize the Bible because we know what the end is. But see, the Holy Spirit spoke to Joseph, but he didn't speak to the relatives. All the relatives knew was she's pregnant and it's not from him. So they say, go sleep in the cave. And what we call the stable, we think of it as a barn, it was probably a cave behind the house where they kept the animals. So let's recap the story and see how this 2,000-year-old story can apply to us today. First thing, both Mary and Joseph received a very clear message or command from God. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying what they received from God was easy, but it was very clear. Number two, if they say yes, their lives will be very different than what they had planned. How many of you know that is an understatement? Does anybody think that birthing and living with the Son of God, having the Son of God grow up in your family, would change things a little bit? <laughs> I, I, I think their lives would be very different 
if they say yes to what the angel had said to them. I think it's going to change things up a little. But, number three, the end result will be that people that are far from God will have a chance at being saved. Remember the phrase that I said to to remember? The, The angel said to them, Jesus will save the people from their sin. So I want you just for a second to imagine this. I want you to put yourself in their shoes, which I know is hard to do because it's so radical. I mean, that story is is so radical. But put yourself in their shoes, and what would you do? What would you do in that situation? If you were in Mary and Joseph's shoes, what would you do? Because remember, these are not super spiritual giants that have a seminary education in theology and they know all that's going on. It's a 15-year-old high school girl and a 20-something-year-old construction worker. They're just average folks. I know there's some religions and some sects that deify Mary, but they were just normal people. She's a 15-year-old high school girl, 20-something-year-old construction worker, and there's no way they saw this coming in their life. No way. So what would you do? And in a way, that's not even a hypothetical question. See, I don't know if you're like me, but when I read the Bible, I think, well, if an angel showed up, of course I'd do it. If an angel showed up and and talked to me, of course I would do it. But you know, being honest, I'm not sure that's totally true. I'm not so sure that I'd even want that to happen. Think about the responsibility. That's some serious accountability when an angel shows up with a message from God telling you what God wants you to do. I think it's easier and much safer to just be able to say, well, this is what I feel like God is telling me to do. How many of you know that gives you some options, right? But this, say for example, an angel shows up. Shows up to me, grabs me by the face and says, hey, bicycle boy, (laughs) I want you to do this. I mean, that changes the ball game a little bit, right? When you have that kind of direct interaction, it changes things. And here's my point in all of this. That God still speaks as clearly today as he did back then. Now, he may use different methods. See, the main way that God speaks to us today is through his word, And by his spirit that lives on the inside of us. And when he speaks to us by those methods, and those methods agree, it's just as authoritative as an angel showing up. As an angel showing up and telling you what God wants you to do. And his message to us is extremely similar to what the angel said to them. Here's the message. If you allow me to interrupt your life, It may take you off the course that you had planned. 
if you allow me to interrupt your life, it may take you off the course that you have planned. But he's asking, will you allow me? Will you allow me to interrupt your life? Because if you do, it will give others the chance to get to know me. Now check this out. We're closing with this. This is my last scripture. And I'm asking you to please let this sink in. Open your heart to this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, and then 16 through 21, it says this. Verse 11. Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere and I hope you know this too, down to verse 16. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that everyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. See, Jesus did this. God in Christ did this, but then he went to heaven. He died, rose again, and he's seated in heaven. So how does God do it now? And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. Verse 19 for God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them, but then he went to heaven. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. See, God gave this message. He gave this gift. He came to us to rescue us so that we could be made right with God through Christ. But I want to go back to verse 19 and 20 just for a moment. It says, for God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them. How does he do that now? And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. So in closing today, I want to share with you 
one of my heart's desires for this next coming year and just see if maybe by chance you will partner in this with me. One of my biggest heart's desires for 2023 is I want to see this church grow. Not to boost my ego, not so, so I can brag to all my pastor friends, look at what's happening at my church. Been there, done that. I, I've, I've been a pastor at a church that grew to 700. I've preached to crowds of 1,500 to 2,000 people. I've done all that. I'm not interested in bragging rights. I want this church to grow. Because I want more people to discover how much God loves them. That he doesn't hate them. That he's waiting for them to come back to him. Will you partner with me in that? Will you partner with me in sharing that message? Will you use that message of reconciliation that he gave to you. Will you speak for Christ, pleading, come back to God? Now, I'm not asking you to hold Billy Graham-style crusades in the parking lot of your work. I'm not asking you to get on a loudspeaker when I was a young adults pastor, one of my um, young adults that was in the group, he told me one time, he was a, um, a nighttime box boy at a grocery store like Safeway or something. And he told me, he called me up the next day, he goes, man, pastor, last night I got on the loudspeaker at the grocery store and I started freestyle rapping about how much Jesus loves people. And I said, man, what happened? He goes, well, I got fired. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. So I'm not asking you to get on a loudspeaker and freestyle rap about Jesus. I'm not asking you to hold Billy Graham-style crusades. I'm just asking you that when you run into hopeless people, people that have no answers but desperately need them, and we all know them, right? We all run into them on a daily basis. Just realize that you have the hope that they are looking for. And all I'm asking is that you invite them to take one step closer to Jesus. I'm not asking you to revolutionize their whole life, to do all these things. I'm just asking you to invite them to take one step closer to Jesus. And that one step is probably going to be, most often, inviting them to church. That, that step is probably you saying, yeah, I've been through that. Man, I've had these challenges. But man, if you would just come to church with me, I think you would find the answers that you're looking for. That's all I'm asking is just an invitation. Share your testimony. I'm not asking you to lie. If you don't like this church, don't tell them you like this church. But if you do like this church, tell them, I think you could come and receive something that will help you. All we're trying to do we're not trying to get them zero to 60. We're just trying to get them to take one step closer to Jesus. And then when you do that, you see Jesus more as he really is. And it, it makes you want to take another step, right? I mean, the closer you get to Jesus, the closer you want to be to Jesus. So I'm just asking you, will you partner with me? Let's put a dent in hell and populate heaven. Let's get this message out because we have the message of reconciliation. God's given it to us, reconciling people 
back to God. And to make it easier for you, I don't have any. Do you have any of the cards, the little cards? I don't. Okay, there, there's a stack of cards. We just got these new, um, we kind of went old school, old fashioned, you know. We, we got business cards. <laughs> I, I don't think they've gone out of style. So we have all these cards. We have boxes of like 2,000 of them or something. And so I, I would love it if you guys would take those and, and we got those to make it easier for you. When you run into somebody like that, you can say, man, you should just come check this out. How simple is that? I mean, you just invite them. Just say, here's a place where I think you could find answers. So please, if you're on board, if you're willing to partner with me in that, take some of those cards and give them out. Let's pray. Everybody close your eyes and and bow your head. This is just a moment that's just between um, you and God. It's not about anybody that's sitting around you or could possibly see you. Everybody's head bowed and eyes closed. It's a moment of privacy. And, and I want to ask just everybody, maybe you came in here today and, and, and maybe you discovered something new about God. Maybe you're like, wow, I didn't know the God was that interested in me. And maybe you've been far away from God. Maybe you haven't been living for God. Maybe at one time you were, but you realize now that you've kind of walked away from him. I want to ask you in just a moment, I'm going to ask you, if that's you, I'm going to ask you to take a, a slightly bold step, so not that bold because nobody's looking around, but in a moment I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. So, one, if you say, I need to go back to God. I need God in my life. Two, he's calling you. He wants to reconnect with you. If that's you, three, just slip your hand in the air. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Thank you for all those hands. Let's all, whether you raise your hand or not, pray this prayer together. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I believe that Jesus came for me, and I want to connect with God through him. So Jesus, I'm making you the Lord of my life this morning. God, I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. That's a powerful prayer. It'll literally change the destination of your life. One more quick prayer. I want to pray for all those that have decided they're going to partner with me in, in this venture of the ministry of reconciliation. Father God, I pray for boldness, for, for times when, when people on the inside are thinking, oh, I should tell them about God. I should invite them for church. But because of fear, because of intimidation, they don't do it. God, I pray for a boldness that they would take that step of inviting them to take one step closer to Jesus. Come to church. God, I pray that all of us would have that boldness in our lives. God, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I hope you got something um, from that this morning. Uh, just a reminder, our next service is going to be our Christmas Eve service on Saturday night. No service on Sunday morning. We're not canceling church. We're just moving it to Saturday night. We are a family church. We believe in the family, and we want families to be able to be together at their home on Sunday morning, Christmas morning. But we will have a great short service, 45 minutes, um, Saturday night, that will include um, carols, Christmas carols, candles, candlelight service, and communion. We'll all take communion together that night. So I hope you will be there. And you can start 
You don't have to wait until next year. You can start with the, car, with the cards, inviting people to that Christmas Eve service. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Have a great day. Oh, 6 o'clock, sorry, thank you. Saturday night, 6 p.m. God bless you. Have a great day.